Oh, there we go. <laughs> I can see you now. How are you today, Kevin? I'm all right, thank you. We're just having a chat to start off with on this. A chat to start off with, and then, okay. then we'll go into sort of like an interview kind of Q&A. Okay. Right, so we'll, we'll get started then. So a first question then is, how did you get into the industry in the first place? Right, it's a long time ago, obviously. Um, yeah, so I did a degree, uh, a business studies degree back in the 80s um, at Huddersfield. It was a polytechnic, and it's now, now in the University of Huddersfield. Um, and as part of that degree, the third year was working in industry. And finance and accounting have been of an interest to me anyway, so I thought it's worth getting into having an opportunity in that year to explore that area and actually see whether it's something I want to do as a career long term. So I ended up actually um, working back home when my parents lived in Southport for a small, very small chartered accountants. And it was basically incomplete records. And this is all pre-computer days and stuff like that. So your tradesman would come in with a load of receipts and a sales book of what he what he'd invoiced. And uh, you produce a set of accounts for him. So from a basic bookkeeping point of view, it's brilliant in debits and credits and window, the side of the window and things like that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it was great. Um, but it it was just small. I think that I went on one or this as well. And it was it was just a good learning experience in the 12 months. And I went back and realised I didn't want to pursue a career as a chartered accountant. I wanted to go into management accounting. So it gave me that benefit. I learned from that in terms of what I wanted to do. I think the money was better in the management side of working for companies as well. So yeah. or seemed to be. So that's the, the career I pursued. So completed my degree and started applying for roles in what was then called the milk round. And was fortunate enough to get a couple of offers. And I chose to go to British Gas uh, in Leeds. British Gas North East Division. At the time, they were um, they hadn't been privatised. They were still a public public company. Yeah. Uh, I was a trainee accountant, and what they did, they rotated you every six months, so you saw a bit of what happened in financial accounts, what happened in management accounts, um, and that. But it wasn't very challenging. Um, you were just used as a, an extra pair of hands, basically. Yeah. So I didn't really think I was getting a lot out of it. So I decided to up sticks after about 18 months. I had been exposed to computers by that stage. Um, they were, they got their first computer and this is really <laughs> how old I am. Uh, it was basically a dumb terminal where you input information for uh, fixed assets. Yeah. Uh, and it printed it off, you press the button and you got, a, you got a list of all the fixed assets and you go around to the various divisions and actually tick that those assets were there sort of thing. So that was everything that was on the computers was actually mainframe system. So if you needed information out of the system, you have to uh, key in a document that the punch girls then punched and uh, oh, the following no. day you got your report off. And if you've done it wrong, you have to go through the same process yeah. again. So the 24 hour delay before you got any management information. So it was a, you know, where technology is taking us now, it's incredible, it really is. Yeah, so I did 18 months there. Um, and then I started looking for new roles because I wasn't happy with uh, British Gas and I wanted to move back to the Northwest anyway. So I ended up moving to ICI uh, Chemicals and Polymers who were based in um, in Runcorn. No longer, ICI no longer exists. It's been uh, yeah. a sad story, but I won't go through all that. But uh, So basically I went in there as a sort of trainee accountant. I was studying SEMA at the time and uh, progressing through my exams. Um, went into ICI and it was a totally different world, privatised company, totally different to what I've experienced in um, British Gas. So I progressed through the line roles in accounting um, from, like I said, a trainee accountant as I qualified, I moved through different line roles and ended up in a role um, as the, the one of the senior, well, the engineering accountant on the actual site. So there's four senior accountants supporting the management team. So probably now you'd call it a bus uh, finance business partner role. Yeah. Like, but in those days, you're just a management accountant. But yeah. uh, <laughs> A great experience working in that environment. I'd worked in sales, I supported sales initially, and I worked down to went down to manufacturing. So it was like really sort of looking at all the costs of the costs of actually maintaining the assets on the ground. And they did the uh, shutdowns and you know uh, gathering all the costs, reporting the costs back to the management team. Um, it was really really useful. And I remember the the, the senior en engineer on the he was quite an old guy, but he was he he ruled his team with a it's interesting to look at it how he did it now, but it was, I thought it was brilliant. He would have his management team in a meeting and he would say to them, so why have you bought five pairs of work, work boots? And 
because they didn't want to feel embarrassed and they wanted to know what's going on, yeah. they would use me <laughs> in advance to un really understand their numbers to the nth degree of detail. So when this senior manager actually asked the question, they knew how to answer it. So it's total control of their cost and thorough understanding of their cost. And I thought it was really powerful. It's not something I've seen since in terms of... Oh, I was going to say you know, what I've so seen. <laughs> don't, you don't manage at that level of detail, but it does keep the... The, the you know the, the the line managers focused on their costs because they need to know what's going on and things like that and that was really really a powerful learning for me in terms of how to get everybody to buy into costs and understand that costs are really important to the business and was it was it that company that put you through SEMA so did they pay for your SEMA or did you pay for that yourself I started I started out in British Gas um, and I'd progressed and the, yeah. Uh, British Gas put, were putting me through it and then they gave me day release of British Gas and then I, I carried on with ICI uh, doing, I can't, I can't remember how I did it now, um, I think it might have just got my own backs through the books and everything, but they reimbursed me for all the, all the costs associated with that. I went on to a, um, a, 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 you know, a quick revision course at the end or something like that, they would, they would, they would fund a lot for me sort of thing. So, I did have a problem in many times because in those days you have to pass them all in one go and there's four papers and so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could take me for six months. So I remember I got to my finals and I failed one. So I focused on making sure I was going to pass it and then failed another one. So oh, I had three attempts at getting through it and everything. I don't know what I mean, so long ago now. So I, I, I qualified in 84, so it's a long time ago. But uh, yeah. I know I, I, I failed my first exam. I did, I did the ACA and um, I failed it by one mark yeah. and all things. And, do you know, I'd almost prefer to have failed it more than just the one mark because it's like, oh, if I'd have just done that one extra thing, I would have passed. Yeah. But ever since then, it, it kind of kicked me in the right direction, really, because I think my study technique was just awful. Yeah. So from then, it was absolutely fine. But yeah. Yeah. So at the, I've done about, I think, about three or four years down the plant on the, on the plant support in the... Um, the engineering the manager and his his team and i was a pro at the time um i said i was moving away or the division was working for moving away from um sort of mainframe systems to an erp system and so there's this fantastic project set up which was called the the business process engineering project which was to basically look at the business processes and document all the business processes and then sort of implement the system to actually support those um, processes that's, that's interesting. It was a real, it was like my first move away from month end accounting and all that type of stuff. And it was something I really, really enjoyed. The big learning from that, though, was that the, we did all the documentation around all the processes and that was a lot of working with the business, you know, the guys on the ground actually doing the work to really understand what they were doing and where a cost impact was, was, was generated from the activity they performed. So it, was, it wasn't just mapping the finance processes. It was mapping the business processes as well. Um, we did all this work, but unfortunately what happened was that the fi new finance director who'd been brought in from America had seen an, an ERP system previously up in operation in the, oh, division, yeah. in the division he was working for. Uh, and he was working for a paints division. Now the paints division is very widget type manufacturing. You know, you sort of get a tin, you put some paint into it, probably you've mixed the paint with two colors. It's not very complex. Um, what we had at Runcorn was a very, very complex um, business or complex business processes and uh, where the waste of one product could become raw material for another product if it was mixed with something else. And this uh, BPIC system just didn't fit with the, the processes that we were looking to implement. So something like SAP would have been your ideal system to implement. Uh, but obviously that decision had been made, um, reputation was at stake, so there was no give on that and they implemented BPICs. But the problem was, because it didn't fit the business processes, they had to take it and uh, adapt it to the business processes, which means when, oh. when you then come to upgrade a system, you've got all these enhancements you've got to upgrade as well. So it was a complete and utter disaster. <sighs> the learning point for me was you don't buy, <laughs> you don't buy a system until you've done all analysis to work out then what the best packages to fit your business requirements that's it that I've, I've done something similar in the past and it's always really interesting because you you find the certain areas where people have been doing something for a long time but don't know why they're doing it yeah and then when you've gone through the whole thing and gone well now you've got your your start and your end to end and they're grateful because you've sorted that sort of step out that they might have been too afraid to ask somebody senior well why am i actually doing this but then 
again we had we had a system that was just not fit for purpose and I think we spent two years on that and then when we got to it we ended up having to make it bespoke at the end and it just yeah, yeah it was just awful honestly <laughs> Yeah, as soon as you go bespoke, you're incurring future costs. It's a guaranteed, yeah. um, it's a guaranteed, um, well, it's guaranteed that'll happen. So, so, That's yeah. it. So this was this project was a complete disaster. So uh, <laughs> I then, I, but I then got a liking for project work. I didn't want to go back into a line role, so I was seconded onto a zero-based budgeting project, which was <laughs> really interesting. So looking at what did the company get from having services in house as opposed to buying them externally. So take legal, for example, we had our own in-house legal uh, department, which cost X amount per year to run. And we looked at what we got out of that and could, would it be worthwhile to go to market and buy the services when we needed it? So we did a whole piece of, well, I was working with senior consultants on this, uh, external consultants, a really, really, really worthwhile piece of work. Uh, the only downside was that I managed to re-engineer engineer myself out of the job because uh-huh. business didn't want <laughs> project accountants or and they, they, they wanted line accountants, project accountants was something they were going to bring in as a, as a service as and when required. They didn't want people like me sitting around doing projects unless they really had a project they wanted. So I took a, well, I was offered a severance package. Uh, I had no choice really, it was made redundant, but it was an attractive severance package as well. So that gave me, that was the end of my career, sort of 1998 in in ICI. Um, The time was a shock to me, what am I gonna do? I've spent the sort of best part of my 10, 12 years in ICI, I don't know anything else or anything, but I suddenly found as I went to market to look that actually my skill set was quite, quite valuable to a lot of people, particularly external consultants like the Arthur Andersons and people like that who were embarking on providing support to companies who were going through this process of re-engineering and stuff like that. So I think I had about 18, no, seven interviews, I think, and I was offered five five roles. Oh, wow. Um, and I had a, a decision to make because I didn't really want the sort of lifestyle of a consultant in terms of what they, you know, fly like most of the Europe would be flying in on a Monday morning, flying out on Friday afternoon. I had a young family at the time. I thought, it's not really fair on the family, it's not fair on the wife to actually be away all week. I want to see my kids grow up anyway. So I'd also had an offer from Shell, who had been in the process of implementing an SAP ERP system uh, across Europe. And although the role was only a sort of 12 month interim contract, I thought it gives me thing, gives me stability at home because it was fairly local, it was Manchester based. And it also gives me an opportunity to get some exposure to SAP, which was the which was the big ERP system at that time, and probably still is now. Um, so I, I took that on a twelve a twelve month contract. Um, went in initially to do some as a management accountant, but looking, but it wasn't it was project work. It wasn't month end reporting again. So they just acquired a business. So it was around integrating that business into. Uh, into the way that Shell were doing their reporting and it's putting control procedures in place to make sure they were following the same procedures as the people in Shell were actually supporting as well. Yeah. Um, and then I was seconded from that onto the ERP project. Within six months, they made me a permanent member of staff. So um, wow. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was good to know. I always thought I would, you know, I'm not, not being big headed here, but I always thought I had the skill sets that they were looking for. Um, yeah, and it was, a, it was a good match sort of thing. So yeah, so I did that initially, and then um, the the implementation of the SAP system in the UK. As I say it was a European system. So what happened prior to me joining was they all they got together two years previously in, in Paris, a whole raft of people in different different countries, and actually mapped the business processes, and then tried to standardise them across Europe. But what had happened was within Shell at that time, it was a very country specific organization. Um, so the country management had an ultimate power. So what they said was, yeah, you've done all this work, but actually just implement the solution uh, as an as, lift it, lift and shift it basically. So take the as is processes we currently have and just make SAP work with them. So you got all, so the, all they've done the centralization you actually got the divergence. So everything was diverged from this central design. So again, another example of how not to do things. I sort of think so, yeah. So it cost, it cost, it, it cost significantly more than they ever had, 
ever envisioned it would. And you had all these European countries with slightly different processes using SAP in a slightly different way. So the next bit of project work got involved in was a European project to try and reharmonize what had been harmonized originally, but implemented as a diverged solution. So again, really interesting stuff. And um, again, taking me more and more away from my roots as an accountant, I was involved in pricing and uh, invoicing and designing European standard invoices, which is one of the biggest uh, if or statements you can ever have because obviously <laughs> if you're in Italy, you have to have specifics around what goes on an invoice and how, how the tax is calculated. And uh, yeah, so great learning again across the different, um, how the different countries operated and things like that. So it's, it's great. And like I say, it's taking you more and more away from that, you know, account and more into sort of IT system type work. But with that sort of finance background, it was valuable to the project because I still understood from my days in bookkeeping, what a debit and credit was and how it all worked and everything. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I did that for about two or three years. And then um, I moved more, and this is where I really had my career change. So around about sort of 1990, no, 2007, I think it was, I decided that I was going to move more into project management. As I started to manage projects, um, at that time, so within the UK, I managed a couple of projects, and I was asked to get involved in a, uh, a, div a divestment project. So we divested the Irish business who were uh, integrated with us on the SAP system. Um, so that was a really, a really interesting project because people who were my colleagues one day suddenly became a competitor the next. And yeah. <laughs> uh, it was really, really good experience sort of thing. And so I, I managed that project still as a finance person but at the end of that i decided i wanted to pursue a career as a project manager as opposed to going back into the line so from that point on was the last 10 years of my career in, in shell i was actually a project manager and did you have to take any further qualifications yeah, so I, took, part of that? Um, I took the the pmp uh, project management professional and then i took an agile project management qualification as well um wow. just, but a lot of project management, to be honest with you, is common sense. It really is. Common. It's getting the best out of people, getting the right team of people around you, and really sort of just managing them and getting them all aligned to achieve the same same objective, and then really focusing on on delivering that objective. And uh, you know, I think that was one of my 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 strong points is getting the best out of people. I can. Um, I'm an honest guy. I don't play politics or anything like that. I'm probably. Partly to my detriment in the career in Shell to some extent, maybe I should have been a bit more political, but I, I don't want to have, I didn't want to hassle or anything. So very much sort of uh, just getting the best out of getting it delivered and getting it delivered to the time scale. But, but actually saying if you're not going to deliver to the time scale, be realistic about it and you know raise it very early in the process and say, look, this isn't achievable. We can either we can put it in and it'll fail, or you give us more time and we'll you know we'll get it in six months later, but we can guarantee you that you know the things that will probably be the issues, we can avoid them by spending some more work in preparation in advance sort of thing. So sometimes I've hard, hard message to give because six month delay is, you know, is a cost associated with it. But people forget to, you know, people don't really recognize sometimes the opportunity cost. If you, you said before, if you put a system in and it takes two years to sort it out afterwards, there's a huge opportunity cost there and you could be doing other things. You could, and so, um, yeah. Okay. It's interesting you describing it that way because sometimes I get I got a lot of questions on the channel from students who were not in the industry yet and they're always saying you know I've heard you've got to be good at maths to be an accountant or you've got to be good at this to be an accountant like there's so much more that you need to you know it depends on what path you want to go down but you've got to be a people person you've got to be able to have that ability to persuade people and give them your decision and why and back it up and yeah. all of that that goes with it so I think yeah that's that's a, a really good way of explaining that particular skill yeah and I mean that was probably the being a project manager is probably the most enjoyable time in my career I really got a buzz out of it I was managing teams of uh, staff in India so I was getting exposure to different wow. cultures I had you know one one team I had we would I did, I, um, analysts based in Malaysia and developers in India customer was in the um, in the US and I was sat here in my office in uh, in Billinge in the northwest of England, sort of thing, managing it all. But it was great because I, you know, by that time the, the organisation moved away from office-based anyway to home-based working. So 
I was home based for probably 15 years. Uh, so oh, wow. much more advanced in terms of where we were, we have technology and everything. And I'm, I'm seeing the sort of the world catch up now in terms of, you know, uh, through through COVID, I don't think if COVID had happened, companies would still be, you know, would still have a lot of office based staff, but you don't really, with technology, you don't really need it as we're yeah. doing now through a, through a Zoom call. You don't need to make face, face to face and have a camera to record me, you know, in a, in a hotel or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So um, yeah. So that was so. So I started off managing European projects, and then moved on to sort of the senior project management level, which is global projects and like I say. So, so the projects I managed could be sort of from ranging from two hundred and fifty thousand up to two million pounds, depending what they were. Um, they were really, you know, some really enjoyable projects. But it was that interaction and that sort of you know learning about different cultures as well, which was invaluable to me in my working career and the best you know the best times I've had sort of thing. But unfortunately, all good things come to an end. And um, it was decided back in about 2017 that um, the Manchester office, that although it was home-based, I was actually assigned to uh, within Shell, was going to close. And they were focusing on trying to, it's very strange looking back on it now, it's only five years ago, but they wanted to get people back into the office. From a collaboration point of view, they felt that the collaboration wasn't happening because people were not, meeting at coffee machines and having discussions and oh. that sort of thing. So, <laughs> so they went down the route of saying that they wanted to centralise everything back in London for the UK. And uh, I made the decision, again, family reasons, you know, I didn't want to move to London at my age in life sort of thing. So again, it was a very attractive severance package and offer. And it was a no-brainer, really. So 2007, end of 2017, I took the severance package from, um, from Shell and thought what am i going to do do i want to work again or do, do, do i did want to work again um i needed to work again in terms of uh, the package was great but it wasn't sustainable to live off it for the next sort of x number of years but what did i want to do ball was in my court i didn't you know i didn't want to pursue huge amounts of money and things like that so i just for 12 months like 18 months i just sort of sat down and sort of thought about what i wanted to do um, I did some work with my brother, and this um, my brother has got a printing business, local printing business. They do a lot of screen printing and things like that. And he just happened to say to me one day, he said, um, "You know about systems, don't you?" I said, "Well, I hope I do." So yeah. but, you know, <laughs> a little bit. So, so I've got a, I've got a Sage fifty C system that's been sold to me by my, my accountant. It's absolutely useless. Um, so I said, "Well, I can have a look at it for you," because again. Say it's 50 small, but principles of the business process re-engineering and how the processes work should, should be the same. So I had a look at it for him and identified what I thought was an opportunity at the time because what they've done, the accountants had sold it to him to make their life easier in terms of generating the financial accounts. But they hadn't explained what was in the system that could benefit his business day to day. So he had no, he wasn't really using the system at all. He didn't, you know, they took an order, they put their order on the system, but then pricing, they decided somebody had then gone and get a price from the brother, asking what the price should be. They didn't have the prices in the system or anything like that sort of thing. So it was, then they didn't put the price in, then they'd invoice, but there was no, there was no sort of, they weren't utilizing the system to its full potential. So I sat down again, looked at the processes and then configured the system to make their life, their life easier. Um, and it did, and he actually, my brother was able to release his bookkeeper who was spending sort of a, a day, well, probably three, well, probably five days a week doing bookkeeping activity. We were able to reduce that to two and a half days. So the opportunity then became my brother could use that person who had a background in sales to actually start, you know, contacting potential clients, which to, to grow the business. So by just taking a lot of that non you know, that inefficiency in the processes around the finance side of it and the stage 50 system and making it more robust and uh, usable to my brother it freed up this person to actually start helping him helping him grow the business as opposed to just being focused on the back office tasks so so i came up with um i set up a company and sort of thought right this is what i'm going to try and do i'm going to try and do this in, in the marketplace so and it's all about sort of looking for the hidden benefits you know that if you can streamline your processes and save time, there's a hidden benefit there in terms of that person can be doing something else sort of thing. So, um, so with this idea in mind, I um, went out to the market 
started networking and things like that. And just hit a brick wall, basically. <laughs> I couldn't seem to get any clients who wanted that kind of service. They all said, well, if, you know, we'll just employ another person. And there was no sort of, yeah. Oh, this yeah, is the point. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is I was saying we don't need to do that. I said, yeah, it's, it's cheaper to actually employ another person. It would be to employ you to actually sort out our systems. So, so after about eighteen months, I've done some. I'd also done some charity work. Uh, did some work with um, a homeless charity in Preston. And they had QuickBooks, and again, I was able to go in and sort of help them on a voluntary basis to actually streamline their QuickBooks system. Because again, I saw an example in QuickBooks where they've been sold to them purely for the accountant's benefit, make their life easier. But in terms of operational activity day to day on the system, the people weren't using it to the full potential. So again, I did some streamlining work for them and helped them out on the QuickBooks side. Um, but after about sort of 14, 15 months, I thought um, of not having any income, I thought I'd better get a job again. And um, so I went to I saw a role with the St. Helens Chamber of Commerce and I've been at, through trying to start my business, I already knew a number of people within the Chamber of Commerce anyway. So I applied for the role and, and got the role. And it was a systems accountant role. And they were using Sage 200 as their base package. And they wanted to basically try to get more integration between the systems that they had. So again, they'd never had, never had an IT strategy at all. So they'd all, these departments had gone away and bought its own system. So none of the systems <laughs> talk to each other. You know, I think that, yeah. So, yeah. It's like an account <laughs> worst nightmare, happen. isn't it? it so they had people who were taking data out of one system and re-keying it into another system. They weren't even downloading it and uploading it. They were just oh, re, then, re Oh, yeah, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you can just imagine the number of errors that are yeah. open to and things like that. Yeah, it's just basic common sense sort of thing. So I did a, I spent six months with it, basically, Again, mapping out, but trying to first of all, I asked them for a system diagram, and it was like an alien concept to them. What do you mean? I said, well, how do the systems, you know, what systems do you have and how do they talk to each other? Well, they're just there and they don't talk to each other. So that was a really interesting project because I did the, I, I did the system mapping, I did the sort of process redesign, looked at starting to explore the, the ways that we could actually integrate that data. Um, but my, it was the first time, really, apart from British Gas, where it's public public sector to some extent, and um, yeah. the funds weren't there to do what they wanted to do. And again, I got the comment that actually it's cheaper for us to keep the staff doing this than it would be to do an investment in the IT system and you know the inspiration work and things like that. So now yeah, it was a bit disappointing. But in the meantime, I've been approached by an agency for another role. Uh, as a systems accountant, um, which I, I pursued. So after six months, I moved across to a company called Nichols. The Nichols um, make Vimto. Oh, so right. Vimto is the product that they sell, basically. Uh, the, 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 the Vimto is the, the trade, the, the brand, basically. So I went in there, um, and that was an, another interesting role because they were, look, they were looking to gear up to, to implement a new ERP system. So again, it was all about process mapping and that type of thing. But again, for day one, I asked them for a system map. Didn't have one. And again, a, a myriad of systems um, that somehow talk to each other, but uh, you know, lots of errors in the system, no data cleansing in the system. So I worked to put controls in place and procedures in place to improve. Um, the, the data, but also looking at, they bought a number of add-on packs. They were using Sage a, thou a thousand, which is quite, oh, Sage a, thousand. quite an old system. I mean, yeah. we're, looking, we're looking sort of probably late nineties in terms of the, that system. Um, and they had bought a lot of add-ons, but they'd never really exploited them to the full potential and they hadn't even upgraded them. So it's like your mobile phone. You know, from ten years ago, still trying to use your mobile phone from ten years ago, rather than having taken the upgrades. Obviously, the upgrades enhance the functionality and stuff. So, we did a bit of work to actually get the get the get the systems up to their latest, you know, the, the add-ons up to their latest level, sort of thing, and then was able to find ways that we could actually improve the processes for the staff on the sort of operational side, in terms of the credit credit facilities and stuff like that, so we could take data and upload it into the system. You know, into the system from Excel, as opposed to manually keying it in again. And this, these are quick. These are quick wins, 
but they had a huge benefit to the people who were doing the roles because again it allowed them more time to do analysis work rather than do operational work constantly so therefore the business were getting a benefit because they the the, the, you know, the credit control was able to sort of discuss the actual you know customers who were significantly overdrawn whereas they weren't getting that information previously because the guys were focused just on putting the data into the system sort of thing so yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to find the time isn't it you know if that's all you're doing and because the system just don't you know they don't work to what yeah. they could do to the full yeah, capacity and i've seen it at every level whether it be a, yeah. a, a, a stage 50 a quick book system or a uh, you know sap you know, even in shell sap we put sap system in and didn't exploit it to its full potential you know it, it needs to sh i find there's probably you you probably focus on about 40 to 50 percent of the functionality that's available if you to explore it fully, you could actually get huge, you know, significantly more out of it as well. And it's what all the opportunity costs and the hidden benefit in there that uh, companies sometimes don't want to, to exploit. No, hundred yeah. <laughs> percent. So, um, so last May, I decided to leave Nichols. Um, it was more of a personal decision rather than the, the company itself. Um, I, my father uh, is ninety three now. He lost his partner to, to cancer, not COVID surprisingly, uh, in a very short period of time. And um, she was like in a way he's carer. So it made it very yeah. difficult. I mean, I thought to myself, you know, my dad's given me so many opportunities in life. He, he was working class. He gave me the opportunity to go to university and, you know, he's helped me in my career. So it's only for I stopped working and sort of help him. And what was a, a big life change in terms of him, we sold the family home and moved into, in, into assisted, assisted living where he has his independence but there's people around him and things like that. And um, so, yeah, so for six months, I sort of did a lot of DIY work at home and also helped my dad to adjust to his new life and everything. And uh, he settled in really well. He's loving it. And um, I've suddenly become surplus to requirements for him. So um, I've started to look back in, you know, back in the market again and see what I, I'm going to do. But I've, I've also, interestingly, in the last month, picked up some um, independent work via... Um, via LinkedIn, somebody contacted me out of the blue from LinkedIn and um, they've implemented a QuickBooks system and they're a, a sort of sort of growing um, sort of distribution consultancy and they want to set up QuickBooks to be able to monitor projects. Oh. So, um, and they had, when I had a quick look for them, they hadn't even got the project module, they've got the, uh, the, the basic, quick, again, they've been sold the basic, uh. and sold the basic module. Uh, and they're trying to work out how they could do projects within that basic design, which I said, well, I said, you know, there's a, there's a, if you upgrade a bit, you get a projects module with it. So I'm working with them at the moment to actually set it all up for them. It's mainly labour charge out rates and uh, all that type of stuff. But set it in place for them so they can then actually sort of run the business and get, get the, money, the, the, the management information they need, which is how profitable are we by project? Yeah, exactly that. Um, which they're not seeing, they're not seeing at the moment, sort of thing. So yeah, so it's an independent piece of work. But it's also got me thinking: is that what I want to do? Do I want to, do I want to be freelance and do business consultancy type work with the system background? Uh, and yeah, that's where I'm probably gonna probably gonna pursue it. I think going forward and just see what comes of it. I think with your experience, that would be very very lucrative. And yeah. I think if if people didn't want that service, then yeah, they missed an opportunity there. Yeah, I think, but again, it's, it's, it's targeting the right size of customer as well to some extent. Yeah. I mean, obviously, your one man band probably, yeah, they could get, I mean, yeah, my brother said to me, I wouldn't have paid you if you'd have charged me to do the work. I think free for him, sort of thing. But, uh, you know, he, so he saw it that I would have been too expensive for his business, even though I delivered him all those benefits, sort of thing. So it's finding the right type of client who wants to do it, who's prepared to pay. You know, I'm not, I don't charge extortionate amounts, but, uh, you know, um, who wants to pay for pay for that level of service and you know, to get them those, those benefits? And you think about it: if you can take a lot of the back, back office task out, the opportunity cost becomes quite considerable to you in terms of being able to focus your staff on doing other things if you want to grow your business and things like that. I think it's hard though. Sometimes I don't know. Being able to show somebody the bigger picture and what the future picture could look like compared to what it's looking like at the moment. Yes. Like, if if you can. If you can deliver that, then yeah, you're winning all day long. But sometimes they, they find it difficult just to be able to to picture that in the mind of 
or where are these cost savings going to be and how is this going to look like and how are we going yeah, to combat it, it? A lot of it is the drain on the cost. Rebecca, they see it, they see a cost and they say, what do you get for that? So yeah. if I'm a salesman and I say I sell pens to you and I've got a special offer on today, I can do 50 of these for a pound, for, for, for normally a pound each, they'll do your deal. For them. You can have them at 90% discount, so you can have them for five pounds. It's tangible. You can actually see that. Whereas if I say I can sort of simplify your process and guarantee that you'll have, you know, surplus resources available to do other things, it's not, ta- it's my word, isn't it? Sort of thing. It's no, not ta- and it's, it's because it's so individual to that one company. You can't say what we've done in the past fits your company. Yes. That, that might not benefit you. This over here benefits you. Exactly, exactly. That's very, very true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's why I think the business, when I set it up originally, it struggles because I couldn't justify I couldn't show what I do, what I could do because it's all like you say it's hypothetical in a way, isn't it? That uh, yeah. there will be an outcome at the end of it. So. In terms of um, just going back to the students who will watch this, um, is there any tips that you have for them getting into the industry, or things that you've learnt from that you you sort of wish that you had known before getting into the industry? I think. If I look back to 1984 when I was doing that double entry bookkeeping and everything, that basis has been invaluable to me. Um, so that is something that um, if people can work, you know, making tax digital now requires the, the, the days of the receipts coming in and actually can no longer happen. Well, I presume it happens and goes on to the system afterwards, but that was invaluable learning for me. Um, I think if you're not sure where you want to go, then going down the sort of the management accounting route with companies and working in companies, particularly big companies, opens up so many other avenues. I've got other colleagues who started out as accountants who, you know, uh, distribution manager for organisations now. But you've always got that accountancy background to go back to, which is invaluable in terms of any business. You know, people who've got finance knowledge in a management organisation, you know, have... I think you've got an additional bit of knowledge which is valuable to the company. But it does, you know, I, I look back and I think I'm so glad that I did what I did uh, in terms of accounting. It's taken me to, you know, I was doing some, before this interview the other day, I was thinking to myself, you know, how many countries have I travelled to? You know, I've travelled to probably through work about 12, 12 countries throughout my career. And I've not, I've not been one who's wanted to travel sort of thing. You know, it's not, travel not one of my, my hobbies or interests sort of thing but you know I had a, a, the chance to experience different cultures and things like that and uh, I've made some long life friends you know long my friends who are in different in different countries and everything uh, so yeah I would say for people starting out get the basics get understand the basics but then sort of look at really do you want to work in practice or do you want to sort of work using your skills to support the running of a business in, would you say if somebody say started out in practice and then moved into an industry role that they're either at um, an advantage or disadvantage or does it not matter you can start off an in industry then go in practice and practice to industry yeah, i don't think i don't think it matters um i think whatever whatever interests you is probably the, the best way to pursue your career sort of thing you want to be happy doing what you're doing and like i said to you before probably my most, most enjoyable part of my career was actually as a project manager well if you had said to me in 1984 you're going to be a project manager one day. And what is, what's a project manager? Well, <laughs> yeah. sort of thing, you know. but, and really, even in, in my accounting career, even when I was in the line role in accounting, I didn't really know what project manager was and how you got into project management. So it's a matter of your career evolving um, and taking the opportunities if you want to take them, because there are always opportunities around. 100%. And would you say that, um, this is just a question I've been asked before, that if, if you are, have the opportunity to move down a route that's taking you away from that pure finance background when that was happening in your career did you find it at first a little scary you know thinking well am I going to lose these skills I have or did you think no this is great I've got this additional opportunity I thought I thought it was great because I'd already made that decision that I didn't you know from the experience of doing the with an ICI doing the process and the engineering project and the project accounting type activities, I'd already made that decision. I didn't want to go back into a line role, um, which I found repetitive. The great thing about the roles I've had in project accounting or systems accounting is no two days are the same. Yeah. 
and it's also problem i'm quite analytical so it's also problem solving and really sort of understanding you know either at the, 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 the sort of macro level or the micro level what's going on sort of thing and trying to actually um get problems resolved that's what i, I enjoy doing or getting projects delivered or something like that and we'll say um i'll summarize this in a second but um if somebody from this decided that they wanted to contact you you know if you were available for any kind of um you know freelancer work or what we've mentioned before is is there a best contact they can get hold of you on yeah um i'm just kevin par so kev no, we'll go kev three par at hotmail.com is my email address if you want to call me on the mobile i'm zero seven eight seven five five one zero eight one six and we'll pop we'll pop that in the description section as well just yeah, for the so that you. we've got that as yeah. well yeah. we'll pop we'll pop if if you're okay with it we can pop a link to your um linkin as well just yeah so really please do, like yeah. please do yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay well um i think i'm gonna end it there because that was beyond insightful and i'm sure i say it'll be invaluable to those that are watching because it's it's hard to imagine the different career routes and paths you can go down and yeah. just speaking to everybody from their different backgrounds just gives that yeah additional insight yeah. so yeah i'm really appreciative and i'm sure they're, they're going to be too yeah so i thought when i saw you thinking of that i thought well, we've got so much experience in your career it's gone down you know a non-standard path to some extent it's worthwhile sort of you know just uh having a chat with you about it so yeah i've enjoyed that actually talking about that <laughs> <laughs> yeah fantastic